is Kimberly Britt. Kimberly works as the executive director of My Quiet Cave. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Video and TV Production from Emerson College and a Master's of Arts in Clinical Mental Health Counseling from Colorado Christian. Kimberly was born in South Mississippi and now lives in Denver, Colorado with her husband and three young daughters. She likes to describe herself as an, an impulsive adventure seeker, a TMI storyteller, amateur cake decorator, and recovering perfectionist. Today, Kimberly will be talking about called and qualified researching peer leaders to launch mental health ministries. Please welcome Kimberly Britt. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. Um, so yes, I'm Kimberly and I'm the executive director of My Quiet Cave. We are a nonprofit that works with the church to try and foster a deeper connection and community for people affected by mental health issues in the church. Um, I absolutely love what I do because I know how important mental health ministry is right now. The need for mental health support is staggering and the mental health professional community is completely overwhelmed. And I also know as a peer and one with lived experience how isolating and how um, just the desperation that people feel within the church when they're struggling with their mental health and they're just trying to connect with those around them um, or maybe not even feeling they, like they belong at all. Some of you might actually know what that feels like for one reason or another. And maybe like me, you feel called to do something about it and you wanna help, but you might not feel qualified to help. That was me just a couple of years ago. I saw the need and I wanted to help, but I just felt really unfit to serve in ministry. I was a mother of three, living with an anxiety disorder and ADD, well, I, I still am, um, not really fond of public speaking, not really organized at all, and I felt called uh, to apply for this position, but I was terrified. And I told this to a friend of mine that my fear was kind of holding me back, and she said, well, Kimberly, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And to me, um, it's cute, but it wasn't really helpful. And I think that's because I was looking for something just a little more reassuring. Um, and what she was basically telling me was to trust God and to trust his calling. But trust is not something that I'm really great at, and for many reasons. One being that when you live with a mental health condition, it can affect how you think and feel. And it can be difficult to know what's true and what's not true, especially about oneself and about God. And it can be very scary to answer that calling and trust that he's going to equip us for that. As peer leaders, we already have the advantage of our lived experience. And I believe that when we pair that with certain practices, we can lead thriving mental health ministries. So I'd like to talk a little bit about those practices, but first I'd like to share some of my story with you. My story begins in Mississippi. I was born and raised on the Gulf Coast, and my parents were Christian, but I grew up in a home that just never felt safe. There was a lot of abuse and financial insecurity and a whole lot of trauma. And my church did not talk about trauma, and they certainly didn't talk about mental health issues. So when I started experiencing uh, depression and anxiety and a lot of suicidal intensity, I, um, I didn't know how to reconcile that with my Christian faith. I did not feel the love of God, and I did not feel uh, that joy of being a Christian that the church talked about. I just felt very defective and um, I felt rotten inside. And so I hid what I was really feeling because I was scared of everybody else seeing that too. So um, throughout my 20s, I was just in and out of church. I never really felt like I belonged until I went to grad school. And I found myself among a cohort of Christian counseling students, and they were some of the most real people I'd ever met. Just really authentic, really raw. Um, people that love Jesus, but that also 
you know, had a, an imperfect history of uh, failed marriages and mental health issues, um, addiction issues, eating disorders, you name it. And I found that when I was able to share um, just honestly about what I was going through, it really improved my mental health. But more importantly, it helped me to heal my relationship with God. Because I was able to no longer see him as this, you know, angry, punitive, disappointed um, God, but really the loving, uh, welcoming father that he is. After I graduated, I was offered a job at a megachurch, and because of the spiritual healing that I had experienced, I felt comfortable and ready to really belong to a faith community again. But when this church learned of some of my past struggles, they not only retracted their job offer, they completely ghosted me. And it reinforced all of these negative beliefs that I had about myself that I was defective, that I was rotten, and now I was unfit for ministry. I did end up taking another job, but this time I learned to keep my mouth shut. I was not gonna share about my struggles, I was just gonna shut up, I was gonna deal with it on my own, and I was just gonna keep going. And it almost killed me. Shortly after the birth of my third daughter, uh, my anxiety was an all-time high. I had learned to actually cope with that anxiety by trying harder, by working harder. Um, I had two jobs and I just had all these unrealistic expectations for myself. And then I had a back injury and I knew it was time to slow down, but I didn't know how uh, because working harder and doing all the things was how I coped with my, um, how I felt on the inside. And so I took pain medication in order to be able to do all the things physically I needed to do, and also to cope emotionally. And this led to a secret addiction that I hid for almost a year. In March of 2020, I decided it was time that um, I needed to get clean or I was gonna die. And I don't recommend a global pandemic for getting sober. Uh, I'm just kidding, it's actually really, really effective because you can't go anywhere. I was just stuck in the house and stuck with all of my junk and I had to face it. So I called an old friend, an old uh, college roommate who had been sober for several years and I got a therapist on the phone and I didn't tell anyone else. Not until my one year sober date. You see what I did is I wrote a blog post that had detailed my journey and I sent it out to all my friends and family, those closest to me, and it was kind of one of those, uh, surprise! I don't recommend doing that either, um, because I had, you see, I was so good at hiding and faking it that people were completely shocked. Even my mom, who I'm really, really close with, and ironically, she's actually an addictions counselor, so that was awkward. Um, surprise, mom. But when I finally told people, do you know what they said? Kimberly, I love you. I'm so proud of you. Kimberly, why didn't you tell me? I wanted to be there for you. I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want to invite anyone into that journey. I, well, for one, I was afraid of failing. And two, I was afraid to hear that everyone else believed the awful things I believed about myself. You see, it's one thing for me to feel defective and rotten. It is quite another thing to hear this from people that I've told my shame story to. I was afraid because I lost sight of who and who I was. I stopped listening to God and I started listening to the world and I stopped trusting his calling and I leaned on my own abilities or my own perceived abilities. 
my fear kept me isolated uh, because I was struggling to control how everybody else saw me. And, but the funny thing is God saw me. He saw every part of me and he loved me anyway. And he can redeem any part of me and use it for his calling. My story does not make me unfit for ministry and my struggles don't make me unfit to lead. Now, does that mean that at the height of my anxiety and my addiction, I was a good leader? No, I was a terrible leader, completely unfit at that point. I made a lot of mistakes trying to cope on my own and trying to do things on my own. It didn't make me a rotten person, but it did make me an ineffective leader. It's okay to not be okay. We've all heard this. It's not okay to not ask for help. I think that peers with lived experience can make the best mental health ministry leaders. But it does take more than a calling and personal experience to make a good leader. So let's talk about the three practices, or as I like to call them, the anchors of a thriving uh, peer leader. The first is abiding. When we experience troubles in life, especially with our mental and emotional health, it can make us feel like God's disappointed in us or that he no longer cares for us. And neither of these are true, but they definitely feel true when we lose sight of who and whose we are. Uh, abiding is how we stay connected to God and to his truth. And it's also how we can fight that try harder mindset. So John 15 gives us the image of a vine and branches to describe abiding. And if we simply abide or remain in him, then we learn that we don't have to strive or try harder. And if we just simply abide, he produces the fruit through us. So leadership, it's not about doing everything right or doing everything perfect. It's about having a heart surrendered to the Lord and seeking him first and trusting him to produce the fruit. In 2018, the global film industry was worth $136 billion. Of course, this is before the pandemic. Um, before going into counseling, I actually went to film school and I worked in the entertainment industry for a few years. So I know the value of a story. And a true story is priceless. And that's because true stories Unlike knowledge, they, I mean, they can't be bought and they can't be learned. They can only be lived. As a peer leader, your story is your most valuable ministry tool. That's because stories break stigma and stories deepen connection and understanding and empathy. And stories of hope are contagious. They promote healing and they show the rest of the world what's possible and that it is possible to live an abundant life regardless of our past and our current level of health. So share your story. The first time that I shared mine publicly, uh, there was a line of people waiting to tell me thank you and to tell me how much they had connected with what I talked about. And it felt really good at the time uh, until I got back to my hotel room. <laughs> And that's when that, uh, what Brene Brown explains as the vulnerability hangover, that set in and it crept in and all those old lies came back and it just felt awful. Embracing my story means viewing it as one radically redeemed and loved by God. And there's times that I have to do this over and over and over. Abiding in the Lord and applying his truth to the lies. Vulnerability is really uncomfortable, but when you allow God to use your story for his glory, you give others the courage to do the same. Mental health struggles can feel really overpowering at times and often shameful. And our impulse uh, might be to just withdraw from others, which is what I did. Uh, but as we know, isolation makes us more vulnerable to those spiraling thoughts and to harmful coping mechanisms. So peer leaders really need a team of trusted individuals around us to support us. One, we need those who can point us to truth when we're spiraling or when we're just stuck in that doubt and shame. 
And we also might need professional help, like doctors or counselors and support groups of our own to help us when um, our needs are outside the scope of what our friends and neighbors can help us with. And mental health ministry leaders, you really need the support from other leaders at the church. At My Quiet Cave, we actually require you to have a co-facilitator for all groups or another leader at the church. And that's to help you champion your ministry and to know that there's somebody there on staff or beside you to help you. And it's really for accountability and also just for the health of your group and for your own health. At My Quiet Cave, we believe wellness is a journey. And we created this tool, which is called the Anchors of Wellness. It helps us manage the things that we can and also navigate our wellness during the storms of life. Uh, what I've just presented are really anchors for leadership, but they also can be used for daily life. I did print out a lot of copies for everyone. I've got them at our booth outside. So if you'd like a copy of the Anchors of Wellness with other descriptions, please come see me. Uh, I, I know that 15 minutes is not really long enough to talk about everything that I'd love to talk about. So if you're in search of more tangible things like curriculum or training, we do provide that as well. And we actually provide that free because we are a nonprofit. We work really hard to fundraise and to keep barriers low. One in four people are struggling with their mental health right now. And those numbers are the same in the Christian community. Millions of people are just desperate to hear that they're valued, loved, and needed. And the world really needs you and your story of hope. And I hope that you don't allow your perceived limitations to keep you from that calling. And if you're still wrestling with feeling qualified or feeling unworthy, just remember that you are a beloved child of God uniquely gifted by him and for him. Thank you.